All right, hey everybody, this is Billy Rainford from Direct Motocross coming with another uh, Zoom video interview. This one is brought to you by the fine people at Scott Sports Canada and Mika Sport Canada. So thanks very much to those guys for uh, all their support of Direct Motocross over the years. Uh, okay, now this one, uh, I'm just gonna start off by saying this could be the easiest interview I ever do. And why is that you say? Well, because I don't plan on doing a whole lot of talking. If you're, if you're talking about someone who has been there, done that in Canadian motocross, off-road, you name it, we're talking about this guy. So I want to go back. I want to see, I mean, you might be thinking you've been in the sport for a long time. Well, not as long as this gentleman. So what we're going to do is have him tell some stories from back, how he got started. He's, if you, anything in our sport, he has basically been involved in it pretty much, as, as you'll find out. I am, of course, talking about Carl Bastido. So, uh, Carl, thank you very much for taking the time to chat with us tonight. Well, thank you, Billy. All right. Where do we have you tonight? Where are you? Uh, I'm in my living room. I'm home here at Moto Park. Uh, been here since uh, 1972. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's where I am. Uh, okay, Carl. So, um, man, I, I got so much uh, stuff to talk about. Well, not me talk about. I want, have, I want to hear you talk about so much stuff. I mean... You keep showing, uh, you know, and I'm scrolling my Instagram, all of a sudden something will pop up from, I see something from the late 70s, then I see something from the early 70s. I think I just saw something from the 60s where you were riding and stuff. So I would love to go, like, let's go way back to the beginning, like we always do, and like, how the heck, like, how did you get into this sport in the first place? Well, in, into the sport through uh, my brother Larry and uh, Jim Kelly, the whole group uh, down in Hamilton. Uh, I lived in Hamilton at the time. And uh, my uh, father was a brakeman on the THB Railway. Uh, we moved to Niagara Falls because he got a job as conductor down there on the uh, Niagara Falls Hamilton Buffalo Run, and uh, basically went to high school in uh, in Niagara Falls. Uh, started, uh, of course, being involved uh, with my brother. I would go to watch the Steel City guy or Flying Midgets, they were called at that time, uh, out of the clay pits, clay pits in Hamilton uh, in the uh, mid-50s. Uh, basically, they would ride there, and there were two clubs in Hamilton. There was the, uh, the Flying Midgets, and there was the Black Leather Jacket guys, the Black Hawks, and they used to have club events, more like hair scrambles, or you know, more like uh, hair and hounds, uh, ro road events, etc. And that's how I got involved in the thing. At that time, it was unheard of for someone who was under 16 years of age to actually ride a, ride a motorcycle. Um, you had to be 16 before you could get a license to race in CMA competition. So I learned to ride at the age of 15. That was quite an experience because uh, they took me out to this field out, to, out in the Coketown area. The grass was long. They put me on a 125 James two-stroke, I think it was. And I immediately took off through the long grass and uh, ended up in the basement of a building that had been torn down. Uh, so that was my first injury, you might say. Uh, but I survived it. And uh, I got my CMA competition license in 1960 and rode at Coketown uh, that Labor Day. My birthday's August 4th, so on Labor Day I rode at Coketown. And Marilyn, I remember, told me at the time that I was the youngest uh, rider to ever race in a CMA competition. Uh, prior to that, the, the, whole, the whole scrambles thing, you know, motocross scrambles, etc. Uh, the first scrambles in Ontario was at, uh, in 1950 in Ancaster. And Eve and Ron White were the, were the key people in the CMA. They were the people who started it all, got it going, etc. Uh, and of course, it was called Scrambles. See, Scrambles was uh, invented in, in England, and when it moved to the continent, when it moved to France and whatever, they started calling it motocross. So it's the very same thing. Uh, in fact, uh, I remember I got a kick out of the fact that in 2007, and I might get some of my dates a little wrong, and in 2007, we were at Donington Park for the motocross invasions, and I went to the grocery store. And uh, the, I was buying some groceries and the lady at the counter said to me, uh, oh, where are you from? And I said, Canada. And she said, why are you here? And I said, uh, the race at Donington Park. She said, oh, the scrambles. 
<laughs> and I said, yes, that's uh, about the scrambles at, uh, at Donington Park. So they still use that today in Great Britain, uh, the term. So when, when people say, oh, well, scrambles is a motocross, motocross is a scramble, not, not, not true at all. Um, so the first race I rode was uh, 1960 at, uh, at Cope Town. And basically, uh, that was on a Triumph Tiger Cub. I had a little 200cc Triumph Tiger Cub that I rode. Um, then in Niagara Falls, uh, graduated high school and went to work for Ford Motor Company glass fabricating operations in Niagara Falls as a clerk uh, in, the, in the glass fabricating operations. I was there about two years and I started my own motorcycle shop at that time uh, because motorcycles were just coming into vogue. Uh, Trev Dealey was bringing in the Yamahas and uh, it was a big thing. Uh, so I started my own shop in Niagara Falls in uh, 1963 and ran that for a number of years. Uh, what I did was uh, I was always interested in the training part and I brought uh, Bill Nilsson, who was a former world champion from Sweden, was doing a tour uh, of the U.S., he brought him into Canada. He ran a uh, motocross school for us um, in, in Niagara Falls. He was a Husqvarna rider, he had Husqvarna. Um, I think I had had my bull tackle by that time. I got my first bull tackle in 1964. Um, he was impressed with my riding, but I think that was because I was the one paying him. And uh, he loaned me his Husqvarna to go to the Berkshire International Six Day Trial, which was down in Massachusetts at that time. So I uh, rode that event. Uh, and, and wrote a number of enduros at that time. Uh, the big events at that time were the Canada-US Challenge matches. We started out calling the Canada-US Challenge matches because uh, it was, uh, there was very little motocross in California or out west or whatever, but there was a lot of, a lot of motocross scrambles, whatever you want to call it, in New England. And uh, I guess being English, the, I had a translator to New England, and we did it in, in uh, Eastern Canada uh, a little more than they did out West. But uh, the Western guys got all upset about that. We ran it for, from 1962 to 1969, and in about 64, the Western guys were going crazy because we were calling it Canada-U.S. Challenge Match. So we had to change the name to Canada-New England, Canada-New England Challenge Match. Um, and we had to include a Western rider, you know, on the team type thing. So a lot of politics going on at that time. Very little uh, involvement with the California guys until, uh, actually it was uh, John DeSoto from Hawaii, who uh, in the last year or so of the challenge match joined the, joined the American team. That was the first sort of Western rider that joined the American team at that time. So those were the big, they, they were major races. The ones in, in the U.S. were held at Pearly Bells Ranch in Grafton, Vermont. Uh, huge crowds, huge races. Uh, from the eight years that we ran, the U.S. won four times, the first uh, four years, actually. And we, ran, we won the last four years. So uh, it was a split, you know, on the whole thing. Uh, some of our top riders, uh, one of our top riders was Yvonne Duhamel, who of course went on to be uh, an international famous road racer. Um, Jack Hunt was a, a great member of our team. Uh, Jimmy Weiner was on the U.S. team. Um, and those were, those were great years from 62 to 69. And then along came international motocross. Along came uh, the uh, Trans, Trans USA. And they were major events uh, held in the early 70s. We had a lot of, uh, oh, going back, I mean, even, the, even in the 50s, uh, the big thing for us was to go to Quebec, to ride in Quebec. And uh, I was uh, always sort of like the mascot. I would go in the car, I was 12 or 13 years old. And uh, all the guys would go, uh, and there'd be six bikes on an open bed trailer behind and we'd be going up the uh up the QEW. Uh I remember when we went from Hamilton to uh Montreal area, 
uh, uh, there was no 401. So we would go through Toronto uh, to get on the QEW on the other side of Toronto and then head up. And uh, people, I remember one year, all the people would be looking at us as they passed us on the highway because we couldn't go very fast with these six bikes and six people in the car by and we couldn't figure out why they were always looking at us and then we realized that the sign on the trailer said the flying midgets okay head just over the window and as the people would go by they would wave and i would wave back and they had seen the flying midgets so they were all happy um for our trips to quebec uh one year my brother uh my brother larry is the greatest storyteller that you ever imagined but uh they went up, uh, they always went up for money. They always were paid to, paid uh, start money to go to Quebec to race. And Mr. Pepin was the uh, promoter at, at this uh, old stock car track uh, near, near Montreal. And uh, basically um, they went there and they rode the race and they didn't make a lot of money at the race and they, kind of ran out of money on the way home when they just got outside the Quebec border. Uh, they ran out of money and of course, nobody had a credit card, nobody had money, they needed gas. So they called Mr. Pepin and they said, we're stuck here on the highway, uh, the gas station outside of uh, Quebec. We need money right now. So he sent a guy in a, a big limousine and uh, he came down with some cash to give them so they could buy gas to get back to uh, back to Hamilton because Mr. Penn wanted them back back in Montreal. And a couple of years later we went, uh, I think it was when I first got my Botaco, so it would have been around 64. And uh, we went to the race and we hadn't negotiated our start money. And there were five riders. I remember one of them was Dave Sale, who of course went on to become a famous uh, US dirt track racer. Uh, winning U.S. Nationals, etc., for the Harley Davidson team, but he was one of the guys on our in the car on our team, and we all decided on the way up that we were going to split the money. So whoever you know, whoever won, there was there was five riders, I think. Uh, we were going to pool all the money, and then we were going to split it. Well, Dave didn't want to do that because he was kind of a superstar. Okay, so we said, fine. Well, the rest of us will split our money, and you you can keep it. So we get to the race and uh, the, uh, the deal hadn't been arranged for how much money we were going to get to show up. So my brother was always the negotiator. So we parked the car, we all sat in the car and Mr. Pepin came walking out and my brother walked up to him and started to negotiate, you know, how much money we were going to get to run this race. And uh, my brother got, came back to the car and he got it and he said, let's go, we're going home. Oh, what's wrong? He's not going to give us enough money. We're going home. So we turned around, started to head back to the gate. And all of a sudden, in the rear, and we're all looking in the rearview mirror. And Mr. Penn comes running back towards us, waving his arms, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, made the deal for us to, to get our start money uh, that we accepted. So we went back and we went in the race. And of course, that day, of course, Dave Sale had trouble that day and crashed so he didn't get anything and the rest of us split the, the money that we had um so too many stories from those days then we moved to the 70s and i started uh uh in 1969 i was approached by mike manley to uh what what had happened is honda had come into canada the manleys were the distributors for uh honda motorcycles in eastern canada Trevor Dealey was the distributor in Western Canada. And uh, Honda came in uh, themselves. They were the first Japanese company to come in on a national basis. So uh, what happened in the West, uh, Trevor Dealey took on Yamaha. And in the East, uh, we took on um, Kawasaki. There, were, there was another Kawasaki distributor, but that lasted about a year. We took on Kawasaki. So Mike Manley came to my shop in Niagara Falls and uh, convinced me to, to come to Toronto and become the 
uh, sales manager for Kawasaki uh, in Eastern Canada. So I did that. Uh, thankfully, I sold my shop to John Clare, who had a huge shop and still does to this day in Fenwick, uh, just down the road from, from uh, Niagara Falls. And uh, I moved to Toronto, uh, set up the entire, I, I didn't know better, so I set up the entire Ontario dealer network uh, over the course of the winter. Uh, I remember I had a, at that time, I had a 19... It was uh, one of those times I had a new car. I had a 1969 Mustang Grand Bay. Um, and that was my car because I had worked at Ford. So, of course, I always was a Ford guy. Um, and I drove from Toronto to Thunder Bay over the top in the middle of winter. With no snow tires. I had this Ford Grand Bay and had no idea what I was doing. And I set up the entire Kawasaki dealer network um, at that time. And I got so sick when I came down to Sault Ste. Marie that I had to stay in the hotel for two days, uh, getting better. And then came back to the to Toronto. And of course, I was a hero when I got back to Manly's because I had set up, I don't know what, 30 dealers on my, on my trip around uh, Ontario, and uh, 1969, so in 70, I mean, those were great times in the motorcycle industry. Uh, 1970 through 1979, uh, total sales of motorcycles in Canada went from 30,000 units a year to 130,000 units a year. It was just a dramatic increase. And at that time, the Japanese philosophy was uh, volume, not profits. So uh, basically, they didn't care if they made a profit. They didn't care if we made a profit, but we did. But uh, they just wanted to sell volume. And uh, by 1974, for the first time ever, and probably for the first time ever to this day, Kawasaki became number one in the marketplace, uh, beating Honda. Um, that's all changed today, of course. But that was the, those were the heady days of what we did. And one of the things we did was uh, have the racing team. So uh, US, US uh, Kawasaki US, who were great guys down there. I mean, it was a great effort in Santa Ana. I think they're still down in that same, same building. Um, they wanted Yvonne Duhamel to ride uh, road racing. So uh, Mike Manley and I, uh, went to Montreal, went to Yvonne's house. Uh, I remember his kids, who today are gold men, of course, sitting on my knee uh, while he was negotiating uh, his deal with Kawasaki for road racing. And he became, uh, it was Kawasaki U.S.'s money, of course, but he raised through Kawasaki Canada, uh, or F. Manny Corporation at the time, as it was called, um, and did the road racing thing. At the same time, we, uh, of course, I was always involved with, with motocross, so I wanted a, a race team, and money wasn't the object. Uh, so we hired, uh, oh, our team at, by 1974, we had Jan Eric Selquest, who I just talked to two nights ago, actually, from Sweden. Uh, we had Jan Eric Selquest. Uh, we had uh, Eddie Cole from California who went on to, uh, to do uh, answer products and later sold to Italian things. And I think he works with, uh, with uh, Rick Sharon a little bit right now. Uh, Jeff Wecker was on the team for another Californian, uh, Paul Duncan from Canada. And then we had Heike Ullinen, who uh, a Finnish guy. There were a bunch of Finnish Swedish guys uh, who had immigrated to Canada at that time and would race motocross. Uh, and we had a team of uh, Denis Dizzy in Quebec, uh, Bob Levy, uh, we brought him out from Vancouver uh, to, uh, to Toronto to race on our team. Uh, probably eight, eight, eight riders, eight co-riders, some of them making a salary uh, uh, and others uh, just being totally sponsored and not the, off the prize money. And those were the sort of, the, I call them the glory days in, in Canadian motocross. 
and I'd say that was 1972 to 1978. Uh, basically, huge crowds at the races, uh, international riders, all kinds of riders from the U.S., uh, Europe, uh, taking part in the races, and uh, huge crowds at, at our races. It was, the, I call it the golden days of Canadian motocross. Um, we had, uh, we all went to California. Uh, we uh, worked with Bob sorry, with Brad Lackey. Um, Kawasaki had just developed the first jet ski and uh, we went to a lake and uh, we all rode the first jet ski with, with Brad Lackey and uh, tried that out, which was, which was interesting. We went to Saddleback uh, Motocross Park uh, and man, we had a lot of trouble there because it was just like, it was like riding on the highway. It, the dirt out there, there was just concrete and we had a real problem uh, biting in that. Um, I left Kawasaki in 1976 because the Japanese came in. And quite frankly, I didn't want to work for the Japanese. Um, it was a whole, different, a whole different setup. The way we had it, JT Manley was the president of the company. John Manley was the finance guy. Mike Manley and I were the marketing salespeople. And we had a great time and it was a great, time in the industry. Uh, we were all friends with people from, uh, from Suzuki and Yamaha. And it, was just, it was just a great time. Uh, but that all ended when the, you know, first, I think Suzuki was the second company to come in, and then Yamaha, and then finally Kawasaki. So that was the end of our sort of involvement, the, uh, what we call the, the white men, men kind of ran the industry at that time, and then the Japanese came in. So uh, all of a sudden it became Profits, not volume. So there was a different, uh, a different take on the whole thing. Uh, so I left in 1976, and I went to Cycle Canada magazine uh, a few months later. Uh, my friend in Niagara Falls, George Klesnikoff, uh, we had uh, we started the uh, Motorcycle and Moped Industry Council in 1972, I believe it was. It was myself and Terry Manley and Mike Manley and Trevor Dealey uh, got together and started the Motorcycle and Moped Industry Council. Um, we later, later hired uh, uh, Brian, uh, Bruce uh, McMillan, who passed away a few years later. And uh, he hired the current uh, uh, president and general manager of the uh, they lost, they lost me. I just move. You're moving your hands around on the speaker or something. Oh, okay. Yes, you're right. I was cleaning the. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, Bob Ramsey now runs the MMIC uh, and has since since uh, Bruce McMillan passed away, which is probably 74, 75, 75. You know, maybe 78. I'm not sure. But anyhow. Um, moved on from uh, Kawasaki to Cycle Canada Magazine. And uh, George had left the company. Uh, George was a, he was the city editor of the Niagara Falls Evening Review. And he joined our Na Niagara Falls uh, Motorcycle Club and rode enduros with us, uh, hare, uh, hare and hounds with us. And uh, then eventually got into uh, enduro as well. And uh, he had started, we, we called him into F. Manley's, and uh, we were upset with Canadian Motorcycling Magazine, which was a CMA publication at that time. We just didn't feel that it was a, we felt it was a good, uh, good for the members of the CMA, but not for the general public. It's the motorcycle industry wanted to advertise more, more to the general public. So we convinced him to start Cycle Canada Magazine. Um, in 1972, I believe it was. In, uh, when I left Kawasaki in 76, he had left Cycle Canada, and Martin Levesque was the publisher. And uh, I joined the magazine in the fall of 76. I left uh, Kawasaki in uh, the summer, and basically uh, brought with me the idea to run a series of national motorcycle shows. So we started the, the Cycle Canada shows which were very successful, ran from uh, 
1977 was the first show we held at the Queen Elizabeth Building in Toronto. And I remember having to go through, uh, through the executive there at the c &E to get that, to have a motorcycle show. And of course, at that time, motorcycles were black leather jacket hoodies. I mean, they, they were not looked at in a, in a good light. So I had to convince them that uh, we were okay to have in their buildings. And uh, we started the shows. Uh, so the first show was there. And the second year, we, we went to uh, uh, Vancouver and Calgary. And eventually, we did uh, uh, Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Winnipeg, Toronto, Quebec City, and Moncton, New Brunswick. So we eventually did all those shows across, across Canada. Uh, the motorcycle industry took the shows over in a very ruthless move in 1986. They thought we were making too much money, which is probably true. But anyhow, they, they took the shows over and, uh, and ran them themselves. And, uh, you know, so the rest is history. So while I was running the shows, of course, I was still involved heavily with, with motocross. In, uh, and uh, I bought, uh, a group of us bought Motor Park in 1972, in January of 1972, while I was still at, at Kawasaki. My brother Larry called me up one day and he said, I want you to send me $2,000. And I said, oh, why, what's wrong? And he said, you're buying a piece of land and we're gonna put a motocross track on it. And I said, oh, okay, and uh, sent him the money, um, which was a lot of money at that time. Uh, somehow I had it, I don't know how, but I, I had it and I sent it to him. And so I became an owner with uh, eight people. Uh, we bought, we bought Motor Park. Um, they only ran club events. Well, they ran one uh, ISDE qualifier in 1972. And actually Jeff Smith won that, of course, he was a former world champion. Um, and at that time I was very heavily involved with Kawasaki doing big things. And I, I didn't even come up here, uh, at that time I, I arrived in, uh, well, when I decided I was going to be leaving the company a year before in 1975, uh, is when I first came up to, uh, Motor Park and ran, I think we ran 15 races that year because there was, uh, uh, there were no, there was no land that people would let you run a, a, a motocross race on. It was, it was even worse than it is today, if you could believe that. And uh, we ran a number of events that year uh, in 1975. Bob Levy was basically running the place along with Paul Duncan and uh, Dan Gregoroff, who was at that time the, U the CMA uh, senior official. Uh, he passed away of cancer a few years after that. But uh, so we ran our first races, uh, motocross races, outside of Steel Seater Rider Club events, Enduros, et cetera, in 1975. Um, we ran, uh, we were one of the first people to do it as, as a promoter. Up until then, the CMA had only dealt with, with, uh, with clubs. And uh, we were one of the first to run an event as an actual promoter, not, not just a club event. So uh, I did a whole bunch of uh, capital improvements, you might say, at Boulder Park. When we bought the place, it was an old Mennonite farm. And they had uh, a pump that pumped water out of the ground. They had an outhouse in the backyard, which I kick myself today for not saving. But it was a, an outhouse that we had in the backyard. and. Uh, we had no electricity and uh, basically we had no telephone. Uh, so I turned all that around and in 1979, we actually had something, we had all those uh, amenities you might say. And uh, I purchased the, because I had invested so much in the property, the guys agreed that I could buy them out and, uh, and uh, run motor park myself, which I did. In, uh, and at that time, as I say, in 1977 is when we started the motorcycle show. So that was, that was a big thing that was going on for me at that time. Um, I had seen what, uh, in the fall of 1979, I met Ross Peterson for the first time. 
uh, Fast Eddie McDonald had brought him out from Alberta along with Tommy Gates, and they were riding Can Ams, and they came to Coketown, and uh, he uh, he was a senior rider, but he rode in the pro class at that time, and he actually would have won that day, except he had a, he got a flat tire. Uh, I think Alan Dick won won the, the race that day, and uh, Ross, as a senior rider, that that just amazed us at that time that a senior rider could ride with the experts uh, on the Can-Am. So we kind of became friends at that event. And the following year, a number of things happened the following year. It was a very big year for me because uh, I had seen what, uh, what Mike Goodwin had done out in California with the uh, Supercross in uh, LA Coliseum. And uh, a couple years earlier, and uh, Pierre Corbet had started Supercross in Montreal. And uh, I felt that we needed to do Supercross in Toronto. So once again, I approached my old friends at the, uh, at the CNE, who, had, who by this time had, had accepted me. And uh, we wanted to do an event, and we did in 1980 in Exhibition Stadium, uh, which isn't there anymore, of course. But uh, we ran Supercross and Exhibition Stadium from uh, uh, myself and Brian Miles and Martin Levesque were the initial partners who, who ran the, the event. And uh, Brian, by the way, had, uh, when I was at Kawasaki, he was from Quebec. And uh, he came down to a 24 hour road race at Airwood Acres. And, uh, Yvonne Duhamel was our hero rider at that time. And basically, uh, Brian and his team, Nick Kemp, who is now a Hall of Famer as well, and his brother Glenn were there, and they almost beat us in, the, in this 24-hour road race. So, of course, I hired him as um, administration manager at Kawasaki. And when I left Kawasaki in 76, he became the uh, director of marketing and sales as I was at that time. So I called up Brian in the fall of 1979 and I said, hey, I want you to quit your job and come with me and start Supercross. And he said, okay. So he quit his job at that time and we, uh, and Marty, Martin Levesque had was the owner of Cycle Canada Magazine. And the three of us put on that first event in, uh, in Toronto in June of 1980. And uh, of that event, we brought in um, uh, the announcer, Larry Huffman from the US. Uh, Larry Pestito was the uh, color commentator and Larry Huffman was the uh, announcer and he had done all the events of the US. He was the biggest name in announcing in the US. And all and of course it was a it was a terrible event. It almost never happened. Uh, the night before the event, uh, Bob Levy was in charge of building the track. And the night before the event, the uh, it rains, the, the clouds opened up and it just rained profusely. We were at a cocktail party. We had all the riders and the industry people at a cocktail party and the rain was just coming down profusely and everybody knew we'd never, we'd, we'd never make it. So uh, the next morning um, I got down to the stadium and the rain had stopped, the sun was out and the bulldozers which were stuck on the track the night before uh, had started to move and uh, somehow we built the track and we held the race and then it rained that night and uh, the rain poured down again. We had, I believe we had 25,000 people, which was incredible, we thought, and we had never dreamt we could get that many people. And you'll see pictures of that, of that on the, uh, you know, when you look up the pictures. And the people all stayed. It was just unbelievable. They didn't get out of their seats and walk out. They all stayed for the event. And uh, Larry Huffman, I remember his most famous uh, statement that night, which which abhorred us. He said, there they are, 
in the mud and the blood and the beer. Talking about the riders out, out there racing, and if you were shocked that you mentioned blood and beer in the same thing, but Americans, that was, that was just fine. And uh, near the end of the race, well, it wasn't near the end of the race, it was probably about halfway through, uh, the riders were all stuck. Um, Jeff Ward and Donnie Cantalupi were the two top American riders we had. At that time, uh, uh, Bebo was Jeff Ward's mechanic on the Kawasaki. And he went out, uh, Cantalupi got, of course, nobody cared about somebody helping the riders on the track. That, that, it was just terrible getting around. And there is uh, Bebo Forty uh, helping Donnie Cantalupi pushing his bike. And he's Jeff Ward's mechanic. Jeff was still going. And uh, all of a sudden, my brother over the announcer, over the announcing tower says, and they're on the last lap. And Bob Kelly, who was a senior official and one of the greatest ones we ever had, looked up to the announcer's tower, picked up the white flag, or picked up the checkered flag, and waved it. <laughs> and Donnie Cantalupi won the race. And uh, I don't know how many laps they ran, but it certainly wasn't the full laps that they were supposed to run. So Larry called the race, you might say, at that time, but the people didn't know any better. Nobody knew any better. Bob Kelly waved the checkered flag, and that was it. <laughs> that was the end of the race. So uh, earlier that year, we did the uh, Cycle Canada Motorcycle Show in Calgary in uh, 1979, January. And the, uh, they had just been building the uh, convention center down at, uh, at uh, whether it was the Calgary Stampede at, at Stampede Park and it wasn't ready so we got this warehouse that was uh, that was there and we held our cycle Canada motorcycle show in the warehouse we had brought in uh, Bob Hanna uh, as a special guest at the show and Ross was there at the show we had also made him a special guest because he was the best rider from Alberta at that time. Uh, so we had the two of them, and we also brought in Marty Smith, um, who was, of course, the, a top American rider at that time. Uh, and we were all staying in this hotel. And uh, what happened on the Saturday night, the power went out in the building. So everybody had to leave. Uh, it wasn't a good show <laughs> by the time we got finished. Uh, and on the uh, Sunday night after the show was over, or no, it was actually on the Saturday night after that power failure, uh, we all met in my room. And uh, I go to bed fairly early, uh, as a lot of people know. And uh, so I was in bed, and uh, Ross, Ross and Bob Hanna and Marty Smith and Bob Levy all came up to the room, and they're just... We're all sitting around talking. Um, so the first thing they did, I had filled my bathtub with ice cubes because I had all my beer in there in the, in the bathtub. So the first thing that happened was that uh, Marty Smith and Bob Hanna grabbed me out of bed and put me in the tub with the, with the ice cubes. So that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, and then I went back and by the time we got finished, it was just myself and Bob Hanna and, and Ross Peterson in the room. And uh, Ross started to talk about how he wanted to race in the US. That uh, his attitude was, Ross was very naive, very naive. His attitude was that he was the best racer in Canada and he couldn't understand why he couldn't be a top three rider in the U.S. That he just, that just, he couldn't understand that. So uh, we talked to Bob and Ross, and I said to Bob at the time, of course, Bob hated all his competition. He was, if you were a competitor, Bob had it. You were just, he just hated all his competition, and he never swore, and uh, roar all the time. Ross was a major swearer. Bob didn't like it. So. Uh, I, I asked Bob, I said, look, if Ross goes down there, will you help him? You know, like, will you, you know, help him out? Bob said, yeah, 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 okay. You know, he's not going to be top three, that's for sure, you know, which of course he wasn't. Um, so 
I gave Ross my ESO credit card and uh, said, okay, well, here's for your gas. Uh, you go down and you ride uh, the first race at, uh, the first race of the year used to always be at Big Gatorback. It's always the first race of the year for the U.S. Nationals. So he went down there and I went down uh, sort of the day before. We, we, he didn't have anyone with him, so I was his mechanic, which was obviously a bit of a joke. But uh, I went down there with him to, uh, to ride that race. And Hannah was there. And uh, I remember in practice, it was the first time that I'd ever sort of gone with Ross and been sort of the person that he his, his mechanic, his, his guy. And uh, he was so intimidating. He said to me, now I want you to watch this practice and I want you to tell me where the other guys are, how, how, where, where they're faster than I am. You're, you're to go out there and you're to watch this race and you're to tell me what they do better than I do. Well, God, talk about pressure. You know, <laughs> I mean, so I went out there and I did it and uh, told him a couple spots where they were making time on him, et cetera. And he changed his lines because of that. He was always a big lines guy. Ross was very big on lines. Um, and basically he changed his lines because of that. He did a lot better. But, uh, and uh, Bob Hanna, uh, I said to Bob during the day, I said, look, I said, have you helped Ross at all? Did you tell him to do something? He says, okay, I'll tell him something. So what he told him was that uh, at that time, the starting gate, you know, and there's a guy in the middle who stepped on the thing to go down. What Bob told him was, and, and it had no box. There was no, no, nothing around it. So what Bob told him was, Ross, when you're on the starting line, you don't look at the gate. You look at the guy who's dropping the gate. And when his foot hits that thing, you go. Okay. And that was, Bob said, well, there, I told him something. So that was his contribution to, uh, to Ross that day. And uh, Ross qualified, which was amazing to us that he qualified. He, he was pissed. I mean, he couldn't understand how he couldn't run up with the, with the top guys. Of course, as the years went on, he did run with the top guys, and they all respected him quite a bit. That was, uh, that was really nice. Um, so from 1980... Uh, we ran Supercross from 1980, and in 1989, we went to uh, Skydome. We were actually the first event in Skydome. They had the, uh, we had known the, uh, we had run the Cycle Canada shows in Vancouver at BC Play Stadium, and we knew Bob Hunter, who was the uh, general manager at BC Play Stadium, and he also, he moved to Toronto to Skydome when, when they opened Skydome as the general manager. So we were able to get into Skydome. It, it, he, he knew who we were and we ran events in Vancouver and knew everything. So he let us run the event uh, that first year, 1989. It was a double header. And um, that was a, so that was, a, we ran, so Exhibition Stadium through 1988. And then we ran Skydome from 1990 to or 1989 to 1996. So it was 17 years of uh, Supercross, which was great. Uh, did very well. But what happened was in the uh, mid 70s, uh, mid 90s, they stopped uh, they stopped the brewing companies like Molson's and the cigarette companies. They stopped them from supporting uh, sports, uh, especially motorized sports. They stopped them from supporting. Uh, motorized sports in particular, and the cigarette companies were just just out. So they were our major sponsors. And uh, when we lost our major sponsors, uh, it basically made it, you know, impossible to run the event with with uh, and uh, and not lose our shirts. Uh, we also ran uh, Supercross in Vancouver for two years, uh, Calgary for one year and Edmonton for one year. That was 1984. So 1984 was a very big year because we ran those Supercross races. And the one in Calgary, I have to tell you, that was a, that, that was a major because it was held at the, uh, at the racetrack. 
and uh, Brian Miles and I were out there. We were up in the press box, and during the afternoon, it was May the 21st, I believe, right around that date, and uh, we were up in the press box, and uh, looking out, it was a nice day, and all of a sudden, I said to Brian, what's that white stuff? And he looked out, and he said, Carl, that's snow. And it snowed so hard, uh, they still held the race, but halfway through the final, the lights went out. So they finished the final with no lights, and we got out of there, thank God. The next morning, we were supposed to fly to Vancouver because we were doing Vancouver the next weekend, but uh, we couldn't get out of the airport, so we were late getting out to Vancouver for, for that Supercross. And that year, 1984, we also, at Motor Park here, we held the first ever world championship trials at Moto Park. We had the top trials riders from all over the world. It came to Moto Park and we ran the first ever world championship trials. And it poured rain that day too. It was just unbelievably wet. Uh, and shortly after that, we ran the uh, 500cc Canadian Grand Prix with uh, all the top riders in the world. That was a major, major event. Uh, a funny story on that event, I invited all the riders to my uh, back porch for a barbecue on the Saturday night. I was going to make them all steaks. And rather than uh, have somebody do that, I decided I was going to do it myself. And uh, so we had everybody here, all the top names in the world, George Jobay, uh, just, I mean, you, you, you named David Thorpe, um, just Eric, the Bears, all the top right, and their mechanics uh, as well. And uh, there was probably 15 people. And uh, I was taking pictures. I had this camera, and I was taking pictures. I thought, oh, my God, this is going to be incredible. I'm going to have all these pictures of all the world champions on my back porch having a barbecue. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I went to get the pictures developed, and I opened the camera, and there was no film in it. So that was the end of the that was the end of the pictures of the, of the barbecue with all the world champions. We held uh, the Grand Prix here in 1984, and uh, we lost quite a bit of money. We had a pretty good crowd. We had 3,000 people, which is paid, you know, plus whatever hangers on, which was pretty good in those days. But it wasn't uh, it wasn't enough to to cover the cover the nut, you might say. Um, now, mind you, it didn't cost a lot of money to put on a world championship in those days. It was like, uh, I believe my total budget was $80,000, including a, 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 a lot of capital improvements that we made at the park. But um, nowadays, that would be $1.8 million probably to hold a, a championship Grand Prix. And that's why you'll never see one in Canada again. Uh, the only way you'd ever see one is if... The Quebec government, because nobody else would, but if the Quebec government said that we're going to, you know, help pay for it, then yes, you can have it. That, that's how all the decrees work all over the world. When they go to Turkey, uh, believe me, it's not, it's not, it's the Turkish government that pays to have their world championship Grand Prix there. When they go to Dubai, it's it's that government. When they go to e even in Italy, uh, the government contributes heavily to the cost of producing the Grand Prix. So. It's, it's a very political thing uh, that uh, you, you just won't see it in Canada anymore. They keep trying in the U.S., but the, the cost is just too, too prohibitive. Um, great event. Uh, Ross, at that time, was was the king. You know, he won basically everything. I can't remember how many. I think 47 Canadian national titles in uh, 125, 250 in opening class. There were days when he would ride uh, six motos in one day, um, all three classes. Uh, what the CMA did eventually was they split the classes up. They'd have a, a 125, 500 race uh, one weekend, and then the next weekend would be 250, 125, or something, something like that. They kind of split up the, uh, the three classes. At that time, the 250 class was the class. The 500 class was, was a bit of a joke. The, uh, 250, the 125 class was very competitive, but the 250 class was the, was the class uh, to ride. Um, 
Ross did a number of international races, which was great. Um, when we, uh, one of the best ones was Italy in, uh, it was called the Masters of Motocross in 1987. Uh, we went to Italy uh, for that event. And that was a huge, it was my first uh, trip to a major uh, motocross in Italy, or in Europe at that time. Uh, and it was a huge event. Um, Giuseppe Luongo, who is still the head of uh, US or European motocross, uh, was the promoter and invited us. And uh, it was, in those days, it was like $2,000 start money plus uh, your travel. And uh, then, of course, whatever prize money you won. And uh, Ross performed tremendously that day, uh, finishing, uh, he was actually fourth overall. He was tied with points with uh, Davey Stribles, who came third. Um, I believe Ricky Johnson won the race. Uh, Ross, at that time, uh, one of the, a couple of great racers from the US were there. And they had all known Ross at that time and they all treated him very well. I remember I was really trying to get Ross a US ride. Um, and at that time, if you weren't, uh, well, who told me was Roger DeCoster. We had, uh, we had breakfast on the Monday morning after the race, uh, Roger and I, and I wanted to talk to him about getting a ride for Ross in, in the US. And what he told me was that, uh, if you weren't from California, you probably weren't going to get a ride. That was, that was his, his thing. Uh, maybe a few guys from Eastern U.S., but if you weren't from California, you're very hard to get a ride in the U.S. And at that time, the Europeans were just out of the question. It was uh, after that that he started to bring in uh, the Europeans to ride uh, U.S. U.S. motocross. So Ross never could get a factory ride in the U.S., although Suzuki... Uh, really did look after him quite well uh, down there. Um, after the uh, motorcycle industry took over our shows in 1986, um, I was approached by Randy Elliott, who was the head of Suzuki Canada at that time, marketing manager. And uh, he said, Carl, he said, I know that, uh, you know, we've kind of done you wrong by taking over these motorcycle shows. He said, but I would really like to start a bicycle show. Uh, I would, would you, and I'd like my son to, uh, to kind of have that, to, to, to run that. So would you, would you start a bicycle show? So, uh, I had been involved in the show business, uh, probably in 79, we started the hobby show at the International Center. We ran that for 25 years as well. But, uh, in 87, because we lost the motorcycle shows, he suggested I do a bicycle show. So uh, I said, well, if you can sell it, I said, I can't sell the exhibitors, but I can certainly run the show. So he said, oh, I can sell the exhibitors. I can get them in the show. So we held the first bicycle show uh, back at the Queen Elizabeth building in 1987, where we had been with the motorcycle show initially in 1977. Uh, and the bicycle show grew exponentially. We, this year was the 32nd year, I believe. Um, for the bicycle show. Uh, it actually outgrew the motorcycle show dramatically, like much bigger than the, than the motorcycle show. Uh, because of, you know, bicycles became very strong. Um, so uh, this year, um, they decided, uh, my partner, Brian Miles, decided to uh, downsize the show, the, the bicycle show. And they did away with one of our major features, which was the Toronto X Jam, which is our BNX uh, X Jam in the show, which Zeb Dennis runs, by the way. And uh, he's actually going to be here tonight. He's coming over. We're talking about our bicycle stuff uh, a, a little bit. Um, but uh, they did away with that, and they wanted to downsize the show. And I turned 75 last year. Uh, so I decided to retire. So I told them that I was going to retire from the show because I didn't want to really be part of the downsizing of the smaller show after building it for so many years. So uh, I left the show this year and uh, not, not doing it anymore. 
um, after 32 years. So, but it was a great run. It was a great run. Uh, last year, probably about five years ago, my uh, stepson, Nick, Nick Hills, you know, uh, he said to me, what are we going to do when electric motorcycles take over the mo motocross? Uh, are people still going to come to motor park uh, if there's no four strokes or two strokes? Um, and what are we going to, like, we've got this, this amazing facility, which, you know, million dollar investment type thing. What are we going to do with it? So uh, I said, well, maybe we should do bicycles um, and start to get involved in bicycles. So we started here at Motor Park. Uh, I had kind of stepped back from the whole motocross part of Motor Park. And what we started was an adventure, what we call the Adventure Park, where we built a BMX pump track and we closed our trails to motorcycles and built them as uh, mountain bike trails and uh, started to get into the whole mountain bike thing. We started very slowly last year. It was a long, long sort of build. Um, and then I saw that uh, our local bicycle dealer in Owen Sound, uh, Bike Face Cycling, the people that ran it were retiring. So we thought, well, why don't we buy Bike Face Cycling? Because our guys, have nothing to do in the wintertime. It would give them kind of a job in the wintertime and it fits in with what we want to do at Motor Park. So we bought uh, Bike Face Cycling and uh, we now have that and uh, we're working on Motor I've been working on, I've been working on a couple of things in the bicycle industry, but uh, I've hooked back up with Alan Jaggard. Uh, well, one of the things I did when I did that was I started an association called the Ontario Action Sports Association. Uh, I had called the, uh, the uh, Ontario Cycling Association and told them that I wanted to run, uh, would they sanction electric mountain bike racing? And uh, they said no, that they didn't want to have anything to do with it. So I said, okay, uh, I'll do it. So we formed this association, Ontario Action Sports Association, and uh, made a deal with, uh, uh, our, our intent was to hold mountain bike races at motocross tracks. Uh, not, not just on the track itself, but mountain bike races at motocross tracks. To, for all the motocross tracks to get them a look. Um, Horseshoe uh, Resort uh, was looking for doing something different as well. So we approached them and they're going to hold so now all this thing with the uh, with the uh, Ontario OSAA um, is all, of course, affected by by COVID nineteen. But our plans are there, and we'll see how it how it develops. So uh, Horseshoe wanted to run the first race on the May two four weekend, which is May seventeen this year. So it's you know they're probably not going to be able to do that, but that's the current plan that we're planning on. I think they are going to open up open things up. But I, I would think that for the May 2 4 weekend, they're going to say, hey, you know, we're not going to open up that much <laughs> because that's a pretty bad weekend. Although they may have trouble holding everybody down that weekend. And uh, the second race was here at Motor Park on June the 9th, I believe it was. So maybe we were going to give it to them. MMRS are going to hold a race at uh, one of their tracks in, uh, in uh, July. Uh, Gopher Dunes are holding a race, and Walton is holding a race. And then uh, Walton's going to hold their race on the Saturday before the uh, their, their their national, which uh, should get quite a few, quite a bit of interest. People start coming in. I think on the Sunday uh, they're going to hold it before the amateur national. So uh, we've got six races planned for both electric mountain bikes and mountain bikes. Obviously, the reason we didn't do just electric is because there's not enough of them around. At this time, but uh, so we're going to do both electric mountain bikes and, and mountain bike races. Um, we're also doing something with the BMX. We haven't got that all figured out yet, but uh, uh, performances. Uh, of course, you have a huge BMX track. They bought all the uh, steel ramps that used to be at the, uh, the 
steel ramps that used to be out here. You know, uh, you miss me? You got me now? You got me now? Okay. Uh, the steel ramps that used to be at the uh, bicycle show, they purchased all those and set them up so they could be used for, uh, for that. So, uh, we're luckily for me, all the guys here at Moto Park have all of a sudden become great mountain bike enthusiasts. Uh, Ian uh, bought a couple bikes for him and Michelle. Uh, Zeb bought a bike for himself and Brittany. Um, Gavin's into it. Uh, they're all into mountain bikes now, so it's great. Uh, Ian's been out working on the trails, which is fantastic to have him uh, helping out doing that. And uh, that'll be obviously the motorcycle thing is still our major, our major thing, of course. But uh, just looking to the future, I think it's really going to help us to, uh, you know, get involved with that. All right, Carl. Well, if you're ready, I'll I'll start recording now. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> okay, but Carl. Anyway, I just want to say, like, I mean. Uh, I told you if you're out there watching or listening to this right now, because we do it as a podcast too, we'll put this up, but uh, you name it in Canadian motocross, off-road and stuff, and Carl has had his hands in there at the at ground level, like the starting it up. I mean, it's, uh, it's just impressive. We didn't even talk about motocross of nations. Motocross of nations or the six-day enduro. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't even talk about either of those. Well, you didn't talk. I just, I just got back, but... Uh, <laughs> when was you when was your first uh, motocross of nations how about that we'll start with the six days the first okay. six days was in 1967 in uh, zakopane poland and we were the first canadian team to ever take part in a six days now we were a bit of a joke but uh but you have to understand what it was like in 1967 i mean it's a lot different than it is today uh, and, and Poland was a communist country at the time. And uh, all I can say is never drink vodka, never drink vodka the night before the race. Can you get me? Maybe it's my internet. Yeah, your, okay. your internet's weak and it's, the audio is good, but the video is actually quite jumpy. It, it actually yeah. comes right up here and says that your, uh, your bandwidth is actually low, but the audio is good. So just uh, keep going. In 1967, go. Yeah, so never drink vodka the night before the race with a Russian. We had we had uh, met a couple Russians and they took us out for, uh, well, they didn't take us out. They came to our hotel and brought a couple of bottles of vodka with us. And, uh, oh man, it was bad uh, the next day uh, at the six days. So that was, that, that was the story on Poland. Uh, we actually had, when we arrived in Poland, they actually had a... a what do they call it, a helper or uh, somebody with us all the time who didn't let us out of their sight um, uh, all, all the time. And then we met these two uh, university students, seemed to be nice guys and whatever, and we had a good chat with them. Well, our handler was still there. I call him our handler. And uh, we announced during the night that uh, we were gonna take the train the next day, a steam engine, uh, up to uh, from Warsaw up to Zakopane, and by coincidence, these two university students just happened to be going to Zakopane the next day. Okay, and they came with us. We never saw our handler again, and I guess they were the new they were the new handlers uh, to kind of keep track of us. But that was our trip there, and then in uh, sixty seven, sixty eight, we didn't go. We couldn't afford it. I mean. You can imagine 67 coming out with money to, to go to Poland and shipping our bikes and all that. Uh, so in 69, we went to Garmisch Partenkirk in Germany for the, for the six days, which was a wonderful trip. Uh, I lasted five days uh, and the, all the uh, nuts sheared off the uh, rear sprocket. Uh, so that was the end of me. Uh, our team was... Uh, Bill Sharpless was, Bill was always, uh, we always traveled together when we went on these things. Uh, uh, he was a great guy. And, and Larry rode, uh, Larry Bastido rode that year as well in Garmisch Park and Kirken. And then in 1970, uh, I was at Kawasaki. 
So, I mean, the money was just no object. So we went to Spain, to El Escorial, Spain, with, uh, oh man, we had like 10 riders. And uh, we, a lot of us rode the F5, which was a 350 Bighorn, which was a, an amazingly stupid bike to take to something like that. It weighed about 350 pounds and had a rotary valve so that the cover, the carb cover stuck out the side. Most of us broke the carb cover off, you know, during the event. I think I put a picture of myself on the uh, internet with the F5 uh, riding that event. But it was a great event. We did, you know, we did, uh, we actually had guys medal. Uh, Bob Fisher and Bill Sharp was both, both medaled at that event, which was the first time that somebody had medaled uh, from Canada at a, at a six days in 1970. Um, that was the last six days I rode. And then now you want the vote across the nation. So in 2001, uh, the CMRC basically put the kibosh on the team that was going to the motocross of nations. Uh, the industry didn't like it. The CMRC was, was king at that time, had taken over from the CMA, who basically faded into the background around 1993. I think was their last big uh, hurrah. And uh, the, the fact is that if the CMA is the FIM affiliate and the FIM have been around forever and they're not likely to change, make any changes in a country as small as Canada as far as the whole sports scene goes. Uh, and all over the world there were, there were people challenging the existing bodies. The AMA, you know, were challenged by uh, California, uh, whatever they called it, a racing association out there. There were major amateur events happening in, in uh, Nevada that weren't AMA sanctioned. Uh, the Netherlands and Belgium were all under, under, uh, under try, they, they were trying to get rid of those associations. The ACU in Great Britain were having a great, a bad time, um, and the CMA finally fell, as far as I'm concerned, as far as, uh, you know, not being able to, certainly not running motocross anymore. Uh, but they were perfectly willing to, uh, to uh, name a team and send a team to the motocross of nations. Uh, but uh, it happened at Walton that year in uh, 2002. Um, the teams all said that they weren't going to go to the motocross of nations. They were, they had planned to go, but they weren't going to go. So I was pissed. And, uh, because I always thought that the international events, the motocross of nations was very important. So I called up Marilyn in the, uh, fall of 2003. And I said to her, look, if I put a team together, will you enter the team? I don't want to get involved in it whatever but will you enter the team if i put a team together and she said yes so uh the event that year was in uh in holland at lear and uh 2004 and basically i talked to the other riders i talked to blackfoot motorcycles who uh one of one of the owners there was a good friend of mine and basically got them to say that the couple of their riders could go. Uh, Doug McRae, the great guy out in, out in Calgary. And uh, so we got uh, Dusty Clapp and Jean Sebastian Waugh uh, on the Hondas. And at that time, Blair Morgan, also a good friend of mine, was riding the Yamaha. And uh, he, he enjoyed going to international events and stuff that he wanted to go to the event as well. So the three of them were our team and uh, we were in eighth place, which was the highest placing that a Canadian team has ever had at the six days prior to or since. You said six days. Uh, and we could have finished much higher. Blair was absolutely outstanding. Sorry? Sorry, what did I say? Oh, no, we're good. You, you just happened to say six say? days. You said six days. Oh. Of nations, but we're with you. So we finished eight.
eighth, which was the highest total at the time. Uh, Blair was outstanding. He came sixth in his heat race in the open class and eighth overall in the uh, open class. Uh, Dusty Clad, who was completely new to the whole thing, and just had he kind of reminded me of Ross in that he was probably so naive. Uh, but anyways, the first lap of the uh, first moto, uh, I remember Chris Lee and Brett Lee were in the, uh, not Brett, I think uh, Brett's brother, were in the, uh, in the um, press area. And they said, they came around in the first lap and Dusty Clatt was in the lead. And they said that one of the reporters in there said, Clatt, what's that? <laughs> and uh, he led the race on the first lap. Uh, he didn't lead it by the second lap, but uh, it was just amazing to see probably, you know, the adrenaline was flowing and he probably just had no idea who he was out there racing against and uh, did very well. So the team did great that year. Uh, the following year, we went to, uh, uh, Erne, France, and that was a scary, scary track. The hills are unbelievable. Like uh, you can't even, you can't walk up them or walk down them. Uh, they're just huge, and the crowd was beyond belief. It was just an amazing crowd. Uh, it had to be a hundred thousand people. I've just never seen anything like it. Uh, and I had that time uh, Simon Holman's was uh was on the team uh uh doug you know doug yeah and uh who else oh blair was back on the team so uh the three of them we finished 17th i believe but we had a lot of problems like a lot of problems uh simon had arranged for this uh this, uh, this, this uh, Swiss people to provide motorcycles for us. The year before we had flown their bikes over, but uh, the Swiss team was to provide the motorcycles for the, for the guys. And it just really didn't work out very well. Um, they had a lot of troubles. Doug DeHaan, of course, is who I've been talking about uh, as a third member of the team. But uh, anyways, we finished, we, we made the A final and we finished the event in 17. Um, and uh, what happened was we all got lost on the way home. We all got mixed up and lost and whatever, but somehow uh, the riders made it to the airport the next day for the, for the trip home. Um, they wanted to go party after the race and uh, they wanted to go back to Paris. So they did. <laughs> and we did actually end up meeting up with them at the, air, at the airport the next morning uh, after the race. Uh, the following year, we went to, uh, I guess I went to Donington Park the following year. Uh, did quite well there, I think 14th or something. Dusty Platt was amazing at that race. Uh, he, like, we really thought he was going to be a top three, four guy. Um, had a little problems and wasn't. But uh, we also had Tyler Dahlia at that race, and uh, we were back with uh, Jean Spachinois. Um So uh, I believe we were about 14th at Donington Park. Um, following year was uh, Natalie Basin, uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed. It was probably the best motocross race I ever saw in my life between uh, uh, James Stewart and uh, of course, uh, European. Mm. Everts? The 10 times. Stephen Stephen Everts. Stephen Everts. Close. It's 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 my age, <laughs> and there's, there's a lot of names, <laughs> and Stephen Everts, and uh, yeah, that was just the most amazing race. It was 1986, and I think there's a video around of it. Uh, I'll never forget uh, James Stewart. Stephen Everts was leading, and James passed him on this very fast downhill uh, little tabletop jump type thing he passed him and uh took the lead and uh stefan followed him around the whole lap they got back to the very same spot where james passed stefan and stefan just flew by him 
like he was stopped. When they got to the next corner, it was a big sweeping corner and it had a big rut on the inside and James Stewart just went into that rut on the inside of that corner and Stefan was standing on the pegs around the outside in a clear area looking down on James Stewart and then we passed him again. And uh, two laps to go, or one lap to go, two laps to go. The announcer says, Stefan Everts has just set the fastest time of the race. One lap to go, no, one lap, two laps to go, it was James Stewart who just set the fastest time of the race. One lap to go, it was Stefan Everts has just set the fastest time of the race, and Stefan won it. It was, it was an incredible race. Uh, we were in the 15-16 area. We would have been better, except uh, uh, we had uh, Colton Fasciati, uh was on a Kawasaki that we had rented. And uh, he blew, he blew probably three clutches that day um, and basically was, uh, had a major problem. Otherwise, we would have done much, much better. But of course, it wasn't his fault at all. He was riding extremely well, but it was the bike that we had arranged for him, uh, which I felt very bad about. Um, okay. So the nations were a great thing to, to uh, operate. Always had money problems, could never raise, raise the money that I needed to go there. Uh, you were at a number of them, and you know, uh, you know all, all about it. Uh, but I think they were all very good events. I really, uh, really enjoyed uh, doing that. And now you, uh, you, obviously we've had issues obviously in the past and last year, blah, 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 and everything, but uh, you still see the, uh, the value in that race as a, as a nation and as an event? Personally, I do. I mean, you know, it's something that I, I just, I just think it's the greatest race, greatest motocross race there is. Um, but, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that it is. <laughs> I'm just saying what I think, you know, uh, and would love to always uh, help out or be involved somehow in the, in the more classic nations. All right, Carl, man, I mean. Uh... You know, a lot of people. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, we should probably cut it off there. We've gone, uh, we've gone well over an hour here, but. Uh... Man, I, I just I just knew it was going to be great. I wanted to, I, I just sat here. I, I think I've sneaky weasel. I mean, I didn't get I didn't say anything. I just sat here having beer. So I'm just kind of. <laughs> so, but I really, man, I really appreciate you taking the time going through all those stories. Like I said at the top of this whole thing, it's like if you want to grab somebody for an interview, I told you it was going to be the easiest interview I ever did because I never, you know, I just it's like uh, ask you one question and say, Carl, please tell us some great motocross stories. And, and man, you've been there, done that since the beginning. So I mean. I've always wanted to. We, I know we planned on doing like a podcast before, and now with this whole coronavirus thing and these uh, Zoom interviews, I thought, you know what? Let's get Carl on here, have him tell some stories. I mean, uh, if if you're somewhere and you haven't heard of Carl, and you're like, oh wait, or maybe, and you heard some of these stories, it's like he's been involved in everything. So I mean, it's just amazing. I, I thank you for uh, you know taking the time to tell these stories. Is there is there anything before we let you go? Is there anything you want to say before we uh, before we close this thing out? No, I think just it's been a a great career and. Uh... I'll be 76 this year. I plan to be around, unfortunately, for some people for another 10 or 20 years. So, and, uh, you know, want to be as active as ever. Uh, I certainly have slowed down. There's no, no doubt about that. But uh, really enjoy being around the sport. And all the people in the sport have been, it's, it's so incredible to know everyone that we've met and, and known uh, in the sport. It's just great. All right, well, why don't we wrap it up there, Carl? I know, like you said, Zeb's there. You guys have some other stuff to talk about. Always, you guys, with uh, Ian Hayden, the new, you know, the current owner of the motor park, the, the motocross park and everything, and you guys have lots of stuff coming in the fort. I'm, a new, uh, I'm not that far away from you, so maybe I could uh, grab my mountain bike and head, uh, head across there and check out these new trails. That would be great. We loved it when you went around the track last year. Yeah, that's I right. I thought that was great. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right, Carl, well, let's, uh, let's cut it off there, man. I want to, uh, again, thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, the bandwidth was a little bad, so the, the, it's a bit choppy, the video, but the audio came through. So hopefully that's okay. And again, like I say, we'll put it up as a podcast and stuff too. So uh, anybody you want to thank, and we'll, uh, we'll end it there. What do you think? There's too many people. <laughs> there, 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 there really is. I mean, it just could go on forever. So you don't want to.
hear that. Okay, well, let's, like you say, we'll, uh, we'll end it right there. Thank you very much for the chat. It's a uh, Friday evening. Have a great long weekend. And uh, I know it's a weird time. We're all isolated and everything. But uh, yeah, well, uh, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, we'll hopefully see you sometime in the near future. Well, thank you, Billy. Appreciate it. All right. See you, Carl.